Hey, this is Matt Singleton, and welcome to Bible. Oh. All right, so today we are going over uh, two episodes of What's the Big Deal about the KJV, episodes five and six, featuring Sam Gipp. Um, I've done the first four with two responses. It's been a little bit a while since I did those. Uh, but we'll probably make a series on our YouTube channel uh, for this because of that. Now, episode... <coughs> well, as I'm dealing with these episodes, um, there's two different groups I have to address here. One is uh, Sam Gipps' group, which is, uh, for the most part, traditional Ruckmanism. Uh, although Sam does have some parts where he's a little bit more preservationist, but for the most part, and especially in episode... Six, we're going to see him arguing as a ruck knight. And then um, we also have to deal with the traditional new evangelical position of modern versions of the Bible uh, with multiple translations. And basically, uh, we look at episode five. Episode five starts out, they're, uh, they're working on a car. And uh, Sam Gipp has got his pupil with him, and his pupil feels bad because people said he was part of a cult. And you know, it's almost kind of like, man, they call me a cult. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I, I do understand his pain there. Um, now that it, it's been a minority position, and people are coming back to understanding this stuff, uh, what do you do when they, you know, harass you? Now, Sam does something very scary here. Um, not in what he taught. This is a great episode. But then he starts off and he says, you know, da, 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 and you got to make a list of what people believe. Okay, now when he does this, he didn't do this. He, he used the sign of the beast. And he's just like, da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, anybody who's into, like, you know, worrying about New World Order things and stuff like that, you hear about, like, you know, okay, well, they'll, they'll be making the sign of the beast, or they'll do this, and they'll do that, or, the, you know, all these pagan symbols. Now, we got to deal with reality. The reality is, is that you can pretty much make any symbol into an occult symbol, okay? So, just because he does an occult symbol doesn't mean he's actually doing it. Um, it could be just by accident. But, this is why I had to critique that. What a stupid accident to make, Sam. Seriously. It's not like you don't run around with groups that worry about that stuff. Okay, so I mean, he, he, he's put that out there. Um, let's see here. I, I think that it could also be something like, because uh, I know that there's a lot of Masons who've infiltrated Baptist churches, and it could be something out of fear. You know, it could be that Sam's kind of running into a little bit more money, a little bit more power. And just like, you know, Yo Homie says, oh, I better flash my gang signs so they don't shoot my booty. You know, maybe it's something like that, you know. Okay, whatever. But uh, basically, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I'm not going to say you're totally wrong for this, but hey, guess what? Eyebrow is raised. All right, so that was the first thing. Uh, when he goes through it, as I said, this episode five really gets to the heart of the matter, okay? We're, we're here talking about the most traditional English Bible on earth. I say, I believe that this is the Word of God. And you're going to tell me that I'm a sinner because I identified it as the Word of God. Now I'm supposed to say, well, I believe in the Word of God somewhere out there in the heavens. But what I have here is just got full of errors and mistakes. And then a lot of those people who are saying that line, you're thinking, yes, I'm scholarly and yeah, yeah, sure, I believe in the Bible. I believe it didn't have any errors up there or down there or wherever it was. See, that's that's the problem, is that you have this fake conservatism, and that in reality, in your real world, you're liberal. In your real world, you can read the Bible and say, huh, eh, that's, that's nice, I'm going to go on my way. I can, I can re redo it over here, I can say it's a different genre, I can say, oh, that wasn't in the original languages. Think I haven't heard that? First time I really heard about that, when I was in Bible college, uh, this kid, he was extremely, and I mean extremely, legalistic. He ended up leaving that Bible college saying, I don't think people are called by the Holy Spirit. And then he told off all the professors there. Okay? And basically, this fella, um, you know, he, he really had some problems. 
But um, I, you know, I was younger in my discipleship. I didn't know the Bible like I do now. And I was trying to, like, you know, get him to understand that he's being a little legalistic. You know, and he was starting to do the lordship doctrine and stuff like that. And say, like, oh, that guy's not a Christian. And I was like, what about, you know, when Jesus forgave the woman caught in adultery? That wasn't in the original documents. He could, he now had the lie that he didn't have to forgive somebody. Okay? That's, a, that's what we're talking about. You know, you want to talk about not being judgmental. The woman caught in adultery, all of a sudden that's out the window. You mean you that can't touch your heart anymore? That's not from God? That's what you're saying if you're a new version person. You're saying that that's not biblical. You're saying Jesus didn't teach that. He didn't forgive her. He didn't care. He didn't love. That's what you got to hang your head on, buddy. And so basically what, what we're doing is we're holding up, you know, the old faith. And it may say, oh, it's old. No, it's eternal. It never changes. And it puts a smile on your face and a love in your heart. Um, one thing, and this is inside baseball, okay? So I'm not saying that I'd be like throwing this at everybody. But, you know, he talks about the Lutherans and the Calvinists, and I'd say, you know, we match up our moral combat, you know, Catholic versus the Calvinists or Catholic versus the Lutherans. Hey, guys, I'm on your side, Lutherans and Calvinists. Boom. Booyah, yeah, okay? But um, at the same time, um, and these guys, I would bet, but I don't believe in gambling, <laughs> but I would bet that they uh, were of the teaching that there's a difference between the New Testament church and the mainline Protestant church. And, you know, your salvation is uh, your personal faith in Christ. It's not a byproduct of any church or sacramental system. And that these systems are systems. They did come to the truth and revelation of the gospel. They understand justification by grace through faith. Amen. That is great. But their religion and their ordering and structuring of what they do is not entirely based on this. Luther and his homies, they got into that Catholic tradition. They started adding tradition to the Bible. Calvin started confusing the Old Testament with the New. And he confused it. So that's why it's not the right religion even though they still got the right gospel, and we're all saved equally. But you do have to make that historical distinction. Um, he had a really good point. The, the pastor in the video had a really good point about rock throwing. You see, it's, it's what we have to go up against. And you guys know, you guys who are holding to the true faith, you know, even if you're, maybe you're just holding to one point of the true faith, but even in that, you're figuring this out. That they will try to intimidate you when you have finally sought out the truth and found it. And when you find it and they are defeated, they will not say they're defeated. They will throw rocks at you. They will hate you. So what do they do? They are calling people who say, this is the Bible. This is the word of God. And they say, you're a heretic. You're evil. You're false. Man, this episode really good about explaining all that stuff. Saying, look, we're just holding what we've always held to. Okay? Always believe in the Word of God. That's it. Always believe in justification. Always believe in the Trinity. Always believe in the propitiation of blood atonement. You know, all these essential facts. That's all we're doing is we're trying to hold the faith. But it says that, um, you know, just like a liberal will say you're racist... We'll say you're a cult. You're an extremist. You're a fundamentalist. That's why my, my ministry is called Bible Smack Ministries. I don't care. Call me every name you want in the book. Go ahead. <laughs> that can't put me in hell. Because Jesus saved my soul. So I fight for the truth. I stand for the truth. And I'll say it. You want to make me the bad guy? Go ahead. Make me the bad guy all day long. Ooh, I'm evil. Alright? Let me tell you something though. This Bible... If you don't treat it right, it's going to smack you. Because the Word of God is like a roaring lion. It is it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And you better respect the Word of God, because that's your only way out. It's from the Word of God that you get the Gospel of Christ. And the Word of God is Logos. It's Christ. This is a manifestation of Christ here on earth. It's this message. And no... If you got a cell phone with King James Bible 
or Texas Receptus or the Masoretic Text or anything based on that message, let me tell you something, you got the Word of God, okay? It doesn't have to be leather bound. It doesn't have to be gold trimmed. It has to be from God. Now, in the next video, we really see the problems. And the problems in episode 6 start off real early. And we're talking about the italicized words. Now, on one level, okay, Sam Gipp is doing great. He's given a great perspective about how we handle this thing called these italicized words. And yet he's doing it from a wrong theology. When he says that, can this language correct the Greek and the Hebrew? I agree with him. And this is something you think that if it's the correct manuscript that these things are translated from, then they can do correction to bad Hebrew manuscripts and bad Greek manuscripts. If you mess up those manuscripts, then yes, a translation of the perfect manuscript is superior. But the manuscripts were written in Greek and Hebrew. Okay? It was a copy. It's a perfect copy. And I want to explain that perfect copy and perfect translation. Okay? But also this does not do the perfect manuscript. The perfect Greek and the perfect Hebrew cannot be corrected by a perfectly translated English. And when you, when you use the word perfect, you know, even the Bible uses the word perfection in a different definition. Not all the times. Sometimes it's definitely absolute perfection, but there's also a definition of perfection meaning complete. Okay? And in completion, when I look at the authorized version of the Bible, and that's the real name, okay? That's the real name of what we call the KJV. When I see that authorized perfection, it is complete. I can have the King James Bible and have the answers to anything that the Bible has as a question for me. There are times where it may not be as strong in one place or another. And I've said earlier, it would be better, in my understanding, for baptism to be translated immersion at all times. And it would be better for church to be translated congregation at all times. But you see, I can understand that baptism means immersion and that congregation, the church means congregation through this text. Okay? Through the text, you get the whole meaning. The whole meaning is there. Okay? This is the sword of the Lord. And so I can understand it. The more I study it, the more I know, the more I've sharpened my sword and I'm ready to go. Okay? There's nothing that I'm missing by having that. So, just as what they were saying, if you've got this, you have your authority and you're ready to go. Okay? And it is perfectly translated. But perfect translation is not the same as perfect text. The King James translators did not say they were giving you the perfect copy. Now, when you go to the original manuscript that says Texas Receptus, okay, uh, the Elzevar brothers, they say, here it is, no errors, perfect copy. They have gone through this for over a century. Okay, many Bible believers, you don't just hang your head on Erasmus, okay, even though his actual beliefs were going that way, they were becoming New Testament Christian. In fact, it was his manuscript that the Anabaptists would base. The Anabaptists read from the text that was received as far as Erasmus. Okay, so this is the Word of God being perfectly copied on through. If I want to study from Greek or Hebrew, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a perfect copy because the Bible says that it would be preserved. But, once again, the big deal is that that is for the purpose of explanation. And maybe you're looking for the explanation of the small text as opposed to the big text. And that'll be good when you start dealing with unbelievers and apologetic instances. It's good to study those things and search out a matter of the heart of kings. Okay? But as far as 
me getting the complete package, I do have it in the English translation, okay? Now, can it be translated in other ways and yet still hold to exactly what the copy was saying? Yeah. It's still the Word of God if it said immersion instead of baptism. Okay? Either which way. Because that is perfection as far as completeness. You have the complete Word of God in translation. Alright? But it was not meant to be the perfect copy. It can be in many ways. Because it has the whole meaning there. Alright? Now... People get into a lot of uh, trouble trying to get around this stuff in weird ways. But dealing with the problem that Sam Gipp was dealing with, you know, he talked about swarms in the book of Exodus. There are swarms of flies, but that was italicized. How did you know there were swarms of flies? Later on, we have the Psalms. And the Psalms, it mentions swarms of flies without italics, meaning that's straight up inspiration. Now, you see, what Sam Gipp was trying to say is that, well, it wasn't complete. Um, that they need the italics to complete the revelation. Okay, so in other words, the italicized words are now, instead of being a harmonizing of a translation, the italicized words are a new revelation. Um, I don't believe that's necessary. I believe that when we start looking at the Old Testament, the Old Testament was not as sure a word of prophecy. You remember what I said earlier? Let me go back. Second Peter chapter 1. And second Peter 1. Sorry. Okay, it says this. And we have a more sure word of prophecy. Okay? More sure. That means the Old Testament was less sure. Okay? Wherein to you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private in interpretation so what happens when the old testament character he's writing these things out and i think it says something about that in hebrews 6 which says that if the lord wills okay well something was distracting maybe satan was acting up and Maybe, uh, you know, a war happened and he had to stop translating. He forgot what was going on there because now all of a sudden it's his power and he doesn't want to write anymore. So you'd have an incomplete thought that way. But then how would we know what it's talking about? Well, back then what they had was they did have a world tradition. And they did have the prophets there. So they carried across that. I mean, remember all these liberals going on, oh, there's a world tradition, there's a world tradition, a world tradition society. Okay, well, that's what you get. You have... The Old Testament and the Masoretic text with an oral tradition at the time. Now, as Revelation present, as Revelation progressed, you have more books clarifying that were alongside that oral tradition. The oral tradition passed away, but the Word of God was progressively being revealed. So you had more books of the Old Testament. So they had a oral tradition at the time of the writing of Exodus, but then David points it out under inspiration under the Psalms. And that's even better when we get to the New Testament. New Testament clears up a lot of Old Testament that has not fully become certain and realized. And as a translator, then it's okay. It's okay when we talk about David and Goliath and we say, okay, well now we have a text and it says that guy is his brother. Okay, that's harmonizing. And it's harmonizing with Revelation that's already there, it's already true. You see, that's perfect translating. It's complete you got the complete package. But you see, these things are things where you presuppose and knowledge of the truth, and we can get to like apologetic stuff, but really, you got to get into Jesus stuff, you got to get into God stuff, and you got to know that He can be trusted. And if He can be trusted, His Word can be trusted. And all these things will air themselves out. Uh, if you are someone of Ruckman persuasion, I'm going to tell you right now. I don't find the reasoning that you're taking to be fully biblical because it had to be available to every generation. But as far as the practicality, okay, my message will be for people to get the Word of God. And this is the perfect Word of God, okay? So believe me, I'm going to be made fun for hanging out with guys like you. I'm not going to have the same ideas, 
But when someone messes the word of God that you've been defending, that's when I'm stepping up. And that's when I'm coming to the plate. You know, and the thing is, there are things where we differ. That's why I can go to brothers who are still in the new translation ideology. And if they say something that I find extreme on your side, I'm going to say, hey, I'm not part of that. But I am telling you, this is the Bible. This is God's word. And you have to know it and believe it and study it. Okay? And so that's, that's one of the biggest things as we go through to remember that God has been here the whole time. He's in your heart. And as you read, the spirit in your heart will convict you of the same spirit. It's the same spirit that got in your heart that has inspired this Bible. And that's going to carry you on through until the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ.